let's get started. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the ISRF team to this webinar celebrating Gabor Schering's book, The Retreat of Liberal Democracy, Authoritarian Capitalism and the Accumulative State in Hungary. I'll shortly be handing over to ISRF Director of Research, Chris Newfield, who's going to be hosting the event today. But before I do so, I'm just quickly going to go over some housekeeping. And um, in doing so, I'm just going to talk you through the slide that you can see in front of you. We are using Zoom webinar today, which means that only our panelists will have their camera and sound switched on. We have turned on Zoom's closed caption functionality. So if you want to see subtitles on your screen, you can switch these on or off if you don't want to see them uh, by clicking on the closed captions button at the bottom of your screen. I should emphasize though that the transcript is fully automated and the software is somewhat prone to making mistakes, so consider yourselves warned. If you want to ask a question uh, to any of our panelists today during the Q&A session, please use Zoom's Q&A function to submit the question ahead mm -hmm. of time. You can also choose to upvote questions that were submitted by others if you're particularly keen for that question to be asked. Towards the end of the event, a curated selection of questions will be put to the panel but please do note that we may not have time to cover every question during the Q&A session. We're scheduled to run today for about 75 minutes. We may run over a little bit, but we will certainly finish by 6.30 p.m. UK time. We are recording the event and we will aim to circulate a link to the video to all attendees in the next week or so. And we'll also send around a feedback form tomorrow and we'd be very grateful to hear from you about your experience. Okay, now, our topic today, Hungary. Um, it was one of 10 countries that joined the European Union on the 1st of May in 2004. It was one of the seven from the former Eastern Bloc. Since the European Union sees itself as the incarnation of liberal democracy, membership in the EU implies that a formerly not so democratic country has already converted to liberal democracy on the model of Germany or the Netherlands or is well down the road towards a close resemblance to the EU's ideal type. Liberal capitalism was, was to have the same effect of propelling Hungary down this road, along with the other member of newly joined countries. Since with this roadmap, capitalism and liberalism go hand in hand, and their newly expanded post-socialist bourgeoisies would all be proto-democratic. Political and economic support from the EU was to help the East liberal capitalisms join the global knowledge economy at a decently high level of added value. They would expand their higher education systems, create advanced knowledge workers, and invent and manufacture complex products. But as we know, in hindsight, this roadmap has failed. It leaves us with some mysteries. Why has Hungary been run for most of the years of its EU membership by a prime minister, Viktor Orban, who claims to be building an illiberal state and to be doing it with popular support as well as with European Union money. And why is Hungary's economy stuck in low gear? These are two of the mysteries that Gabor Schering addresses in his book. I'll mention several features of the book before turning the discussion over to him. The first is it's, a, it's Agatha Christie structure, Gabor, Hercule Poirot brings all of the guests into the library to question all of them, not just the usual suspects. The culprit is not Orban as such, or a supposedly illiberal Hungarian deep culture. The book shows how the suspects work together and draws links among them quite carefully. The second is the book's remarkable conjunction of theory and multiple sources of empirical evidence. Uh, the ISRF supports interdisciplinary research on the understanding that it is very hard to do well. Dr. Schering's argument rests on an exemplary marshalling of quantitative and qualitative evidence, which is hard to gather and also to interpret. One benefit is that the full range of Hungarian society is able to speak uh, at various points in the book. And then third, um, he continuously connects political and economic systems, allowing each autonomy from the other refusing to reduce politics to an economic base or vice versa, while making everyday economic experience part of the picture. Dr. Sharon's research is a good example of new work in political economy that the foundation is very happy to support and which promises new answers to naughty questions. 
Okay, as I did last month, I want to close here by noting resonances among the books that have wound up in our ISRF launch series. In November, in her book, Freedom, Anneline de Dang argued that the only truly valuable form of freedom is democratic freedom and not the negative individualist kind, even though the democratic form is generally marginalized in the West. In February, in his book, An African Path to Disability Justice, Oche Onazi redefines disability justice through Ubuntu, a relational and not an individualist notion of personhood, one that does not require, in Oche's reading, symmetrical capabilities between persons. And in March, in his book, Victory, Kian O'Driscoll argues that to the extent that just war actually exists, it must emerge from a collective decision process that bears in mind a nation's or group's relations to the appointed enemy. In April, in her book, Being Sure of Each Other, Kimberly Brownlee offered detailed philosophical reasons for why social rights are more fundamental than individual rights, including the classical liberal right of individual freedom of association. Today, Dr. Sharon shows the readiness with which liberal market relations can be turned into what he is calling authoritarian capitalism and how democracy can be used to replace a developmental with an accumulative state. Although this set of fellows would, were they all here today, certainly disagree on various things from their diverse disciplines, they are mounting a collective challenge to 19th century liberal individualism and to the neoliberal updates that have provided both landmarks and dead ends for the North Atlantic world. Okay, so as Lars mentioned, we'll hear first from Gabor, then from two commentators, and we're fortunate to have two remarkably learned authorities on Eastern Europe with us today. Chris Hahn coming to us from Halle, Germany, and Charles Strohschein in London. Um, and then Gabor will respond briefly after they speak, and then we'll open it up for questions. All right, so on to introduce uh, Gabor sharing briefly. He is currently a Marie Curie Fellow in the Department of Social and Political Sciences in Bocconi University in Italy and was an ISRF Political Economy Fellow in 2017-18. He received his BA from Corvinus University in Budapest and his doctorate from the University of Cambridge. He is both an economic sociologist and a long-term political organizer for sustainability and social rights, a career which led him to serving as a member of Hungary's National Assembly from 2010 to 14 as a representative for the Green Party. In addition to the work we'll hear him discuss in a minute, he has published extensively on the political economy of health, the impact of privatization on mortality, the post-socialist mortality crisis, and on stress and inequality under both post-socialism and Europe's current forms of capitalism. For the non-specialists among us, myself included, I can recommend a couple of timely pieces that he has published at the Open, Open Democracy website. One is called Hungary's Regime is Proof that Capitalism Can Be Deeply Authoritarian, and the other Insights from Hungary to Beat Trumpism, which is unfortunately still quite relevant. Um, Gabor, it's a real pleasure to have you with us. Um, thanks for being here. Let me turn it over to you. Introduction. Um, so uh, before I start my presentation about the about the book, uh, just let me say that I am truly uh, grateful uh, for this opportunity uh, to 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 discuss uh, my book here. Uh, Organized by 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 ISRF and of course also um, uh, for the opportunity uh, to spend the year as an ISRF political economy fellow, which was uh, which was uh, extremely uh, useful uh, um, year for me to finish this book in parallel to to my PhD or after my PhD, basically. Um, so as uh, as Chris pointed out uh, in in his uh, introduction, I am. Um, Sort of a recovering politician, um, as he 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 said. I I I, I was a uh, indeed uh, a member of the Hungarian Parliament uh, from 2010 to 2014, which is uh, um, just uh, so we. I was elected to the to the Parliament when when Viktor Orbán was also elected back to the to to power with uh, two thirds majority. So so my book is uh, is. Uh, is in part an attempt 
to uh, to try to make sense of of uh, this experience in politics, which goes back to to the 2000s, basically uh, uh, as the um, our party grew out of of Hungarian Green and Global Justice movements, and and our idea was to to renew. Uh, progressive politics in Hungary, and I think uh, in many ways we we failed. And uh, our failure is related to to the success of of Viktor Orbán. And so so this this sort of political strategic uh, dile dilemma uh, was one of the reasons I, I embarked on, on on this book. And the other is more academic, uh, related to 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 my academic interest in 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 general um, about the social. And uh, effects of, of neoliberal policies, and and uh, my other research area is indeed the how policies such as privatization or liberalization, deindustrialization affect uh, uh, health inequalities, and 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 uh, in many cases these health inequalities caused by neoliberal policies then feed back into politics by by fueling. Uh, the rise of populism. So this is the the, the general context of, of my book. And let me give you a, a very brief uh, uh, overview of of, um, of the narrative that I'm presenting in the book. Uh, I've uh, uh, presented prepared a brief presentation. Um, um, so um, Hungary uh, was considered until the early 2000s as as one of the most successful transition countries. And it was uh, praised by various in international institutions, such as the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, um, which produced these transition reports uh, about how well countries are doing. And you know, this this graph shows you uh, the, the the prevailing uh, sentiment of the 90s and 2000s that uh, that, that that was based on the belief that. Uh, uh, the more uh, advanced, uh, the, the more you liberalize your economy, the higher your chances will be to uh, um, to consolidate liberal democracy. Um, so uh, you know, basically, the the this uh, ideology of the end of history was operationalized this way in Eastern Europe, uh, uh, leading to the belief that. Uh, liberal capitalism and liberal democracy um, uh, will necessarily go hand in hand. And even if it uh, creates some tensions, then the bourgeoisie, the new economic elite that will be created through these reforms will then propagate further democratization because then the idea was that uh, 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 the economic elites, the bourgeoisie would be a, nat a natural supporter of, of democratization. But I think that his story uh, represents a fundamental challenge to this uh, to this uh, liberal optimism of of, uh, of the 90s and, and 2000s and related social theories and political science theories, and and my book is 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 an attempt to make sense of of this challenge, and uh, what this graph shows you is how uh, Hungary turned from from the star pupil of democratization to to be a front runner of, of uh, democratic backsliding of, of illiberalism in Eastern Europe. The other country is Poland, uh, which, is, uh, which has been suffering severe backsliding uh, recently. I, I, I also have a paper uh, um, comparing the countries in Eastern Europe. I won't have the time um, in this presentation to go into the details, uh, but if you have any questions, I, I'm very happy to uh, to co come back, come back to this. But just to point out uh, in the previous graph, it was uh, Hungary and Poland at the top, uh, and now again it's Hungary and Poland. So the two lead reformers are now the two uh, worst cases of democratic backsliding. So I really think that this is a fundamental challenge uh, to 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 the prevailing theories of democratization, which considered uh, liberal capitalism and liberal democracy as as mutually reinforcing uh, spheres or institutions. And even if you looked at the literature in 2010 when Viktor Orban was elected, the journals were full of articles, recently published articles in 2010 that were predicting no, uh, that there won't be any backsliding because of the institutions that these countries uh, have built up. And then they also joined the European Union. So 
really that won't the, the, they saw uh, a, a very low likelihood, a very low chance for what actually uh, happened in the 2000s. And there are two alternative explanations out there that my book uh, in part challenges, in part extends. Uh, one is about the political rogues or political elites. Uh, these explanations, uh, uh, you know, previously the idea was that what you need is you need good politicians to install good institutions. But of course, analysts are saying that that something went wrong and now good those uh, previously believed good institutions are collapsing. And then the obvious explanation is, well, it's because uh, now we have bad politicians. So instead of good politicians, it's now the bad politicians, the political rogues that, uh, that create trouble. Um, it's about the supply of illiberal populist ideas, corruption, bad politics. Um, and of course, uh, the supply of, of illiberalism is, is crucial. But it in, it, in itself, uh, it's, it cannot explain why good politics, so to speak, was successful and bad politics unsuccessful before 2010. Um, the other very popular alternative explanation is uh, about culture, uh, a simplistic way of looking at culture, about illiberal people. So these uh, explanations very often assume that Eastern European countries, and in general, uh, today's post-capitalism or late capitalist societies are classless societies. And it's uh, more about culture. Current, current uh, political conflicts are more about culture. In the case of Eastern Europe, it's about historical legacies, such as the legacy of, of uh, socialism or servant mentality, or very frequently uh, anti-migrant attitudes uh, that are evoked as, as explanations of, of, uh, of illiberalism. But empirical research that I also cite in my book clearly shows that there was no demand for illiberalism before 2009. So I don't think that these theories, these exercises that try to sort of, they don't really try to go beyond uh, the, 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 the liberal transition framework, the, the democratization paradigm that was prevalent in the 90s and 2000s. They just rather try to, uh, you know, uh, they offer some minor modifications, but rather try to save the, the, the whole building. Uh, what, I, what I think is, is really that we need a new theoretical building, we new, for, from, from the bottom up, uh, built on new foundations. And uh, these foundations that I'm building on in, in, the, in the book are uh, the theory of democracy as a class compromise. I rely on dependency theory, dependent development in particular, sociology of power structures, sociology of internationalism, and political economy of, the, of, of accumulation strategies. I won't get into the theoretical details. There are two chapters on this in, in, in the book. I'd rather focus on, on, on the narrative and the empirical strategy in the, in the remaining few minutes. Uh, so uh, I use this theoretical framework to analyze two big uh, processes that led to illiberalism and explain the stability of illiberalism uh, uh, in Hungary, both related to the way Hungary integrated into the global capitalist economy. So it was a kind of dependent integration driven by, <clears throat> by, by uh, foreign investment and foreign capital, which uh, uh, helped the country to uh, develop a relatively modern uh, export sector. Uh, but the problem was that this export sector did not uh, spill over to the, the domestic part of the economy. So it created a massive economic disintegration. You have these islands of transnational corporations producing for export. And they, what they do is basically they use the still relatively cheap Hungarian labor to assemble things, uh, imported parts, uh, and then they export it back. Uh, mostly cars, these are the most important uh, industrial products that Hungary um, produces and, and production takes place in, in local plants of, of transnational corporations, uh, relying mostly on, on domestic labor and using uh, foreign technology. So it doesn't really help uh, uh, to, to the local economy to develop and led to a polarization of the economic elite. Uh, and this polarization of the economic elite uh, led basically to, to revolt among the elite itself, among the economic elite, or at least the part of the economic elite, namely the national capitalists, who could not really uh, uh, 
um, take part so successfully in the new uh, global capitalist uh, uh, markets as as uh, as uh, transnational corporations. Um, and they were also lobbying the left liberal governments, but they were not open. So it was Orban, uh, Viktor Orban and Fidesz uh, the, that proved to be uh, particularly sensitive to, uh, to the plights of the domestic uh, bourgeoisie and offered the new class compromise. And what he did was basically he, he elevated, he invited the domestic bourgeoisie to take part in the in the power coalition, he didn't throw out transnational corporations, so they are still enjoying the support of the state. Uh, but what Orbán did was inviting domestic capital and and accelerating domestic capital ac accumulation, but also distributing even more funds to German car exporters and other transnational corporations in in the export sectors. So the way I show this in the book is using uh, economic analysis, using macro data, but I also assembled a, a new data set on revolving doors between the political and the economic elites. Uh, and for example, I show how much more likely it is to find uh, bankers or managers of transnational corporations among the so-called left liberal elite as, a, as opposed to the right-wing elite in, in Hungary, which shows you how the polarization of the economic elite and the polarization of the political elite played into this dynamism of illiberalism, in, in, of the illiberal breakthrough. And the other important part of the story is, is the revolt of the working class, which also starts from the same uh, uh, mismanaged integration to the global economy. And uh, it also led to social disintegration. So jobless growth, uh, rapidly growing income inequalities, uh, very, various forms of precarity, indebtedness. Hungary also experienced a massive uh, mortality crisis in the early 90s. And, and these industrialized towns uh, in rural Hungary uh, created uh, um, all kinds of cascading social and economic problems that have long effects on, on people's identities. And this is what I show with 82 interviews with workers in, 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 in Hungary, Rastbel. So Viktor Orbán relied on the revolt or the disillusionment of, of the workers who previously represented the most important electoral, uh, electoral base of, of, of the Socialist Party in Hungary, especially in rural Hungary. But their revolt against uh, liberal capitalism meant that the Socialist Party lost uh, uh, its uh, previous uh, regional strongholds. And, and this allowed really Viktor Orban to, to conquer the whole, whole country, so to speak. But what has happened after 2010 is not really a kind of you know, a traditional populist regime in a Latin American sense, uh, populist meaning uh, governing uh, irresponsibly by redistributing money to the masses. In fact, because Viktor Orban uh, created a new class alliance with between the domestic and transnational capital, the way he was able to do this was accelerating capital accumulation, which creates all kinds of new tensions, social tensions, social polarization. So Hungary by now is the most unequal country in Eastern Europe. And here I just want to uh, draw your attention to the last part of this graph, which, which presents the same argument graphically. So I think authoritarianism in Hungary after 2010 is in part, not completely, but in part, a result of, of Viktor Orban's economic strategy uh, to, to change the course of Hungary's development uh, after this liberal foreign investment driven developmental model exhausted, and, and he tries to uh, change this uh, model. But uh, because he's not really able to invest into a highly skilled bureaucracy, like the ones you observed in East Asia that is needed to create long-term economic development. Um, I don't think Hungary is now a developmental state. So although you have this kind of economic nationalism, you don't have a developmental state in Hungary because you lack a highly skilled independent bureaucracy. The bureaucracy that the state is subsumed to the interest of, of economic and power, uh, economic and political power holders. So this is what I call in the book, uh, uh, the, 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 the accumulative the accumulative state, which is a form basically in Hungary of a, of a mutation of neoliberalism, a national populist mutation of, 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 uh, of neoliberalism. 
And uh, clearly, domestic elites prefer economic nationalism. But transnational neo neoliberal elites uh, are also ready to make a pact with, uh, with Hungary's nationalists. And you can see the same pattern emerging in, in many other countries. And, and Hungary is just such a, a, a great example of this, especially uh, the alliance between German capital and, and Hungarian capital and the way Viktor Orban facilitates this, this kind of uh, uh, Great new happy capitalist uh, alliance and uses authoritarianism and authoritarian populism and nationalism to to uh, sustain a regime that is uh, highly uh, highly polarizing. So thank you very much for 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 the opportunity to, uh, uh, again to to present a summary of the the book. And here are some uh, some 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 articles uh, related to. To the book itself, and of course, the book is is available also online for for download through Springer Link. If you have access to any basically public library or university library, uh, you can you can download it for uh, for free uh, from there. Uh, and thanks, thanks again. Oh, thanks a lot, Gabor. That was really very helpful. Um, our first commentator is Chris Hahn who is the founding director of the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology in Halle, Germany, where he has worked since 1999. He took his bachelor's degree from Oxford University and his PhD from Cambridge, during which time he did field work in the Danube Zitza interfluvial region, focusing in particular on the town of Tazlar, memorialized in his book, Tazlar, a village in Hungary, and which was continued in a project the new property system in Tazlar. It was a villager who gave him the title for the book that presents some of this research on the effects of rural privatization, not the horse we wanted, post-socialism, neoliberalism, and Eurasia, which came out in 2006. Uh, Chris is a synthesizer of comparative political theory, multinational ethnographic research, and long-term history, and a crosser of conventional linguistic and geographical frontiers his cross-disciplinary collaborations are legion, covering a range of topics that includes uh, economy and ritual, industry and inequality in Eurasia, financialization, and recently concluded an ERC grant entitled Realizing Eurasia, Civilization and Moral Economy in the 21st Century. Uh, he has been a member of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences since 2008. And in the interest of time, I'll just scratch the surface by stopping here. Um, Chris Hahn, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you with us. The first thing I would like to say this evening is that the book we're talking about is an outstanding scholarly achievement. I find its main arguments concerning the political economy of Hungary over the last three decades entirely convincing. I would just like to expand the discussion in a few small ways, in particular by pushing Gabor's story a little bit further back in time. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, I am not a historian. I'm a social anthropologist. Uh, I do field work in villages and small towns. I'm going to present a worm's eye view of the developments that Gabor was talking about at a more macro level, uh, whereas he can identify classes such as the national capitalists, and talk about abstractions like the bureaucracy. As an anthropologist, I have enormous trouble in dealing with uh, that magnitude of social phenomena. So I'm going to offer the worm's eye view from a particular part of provincial Hungary. Another difference between Gabor and myself is that he is an insider to Hungary, whereas I had to learn Hungarian in the third decade of my life, and I'm still struggling with it. So oh, please bear that in mind. His interpretations, although he is more identifying as a political economist, sociologist, but he's an insider in a way that I could never be, although I have done a lot of field work in Hungary. But the main difference between Gabor and myself that is relevant for my purpose in this short commentary is one of generation. Gabor is far too young to remember the excited discussions of the late 1980s. They're still very vivid in my mind before the round table talks that led to the first free democratic elections. I can remember those years. 
the excited discussions about how best to replace a discredited, inefficient version of socialism. There were lots of idealist philosophers taking part with notions of free civil society. And there were also lots of hard-nosed economists who probably had more influence. Many of them were familiar with Western trends in economics. And you might even say some of those Hungarians in the 1980s were enthusiastic neoliberals avant la lettre, but before that word really took off in the wake of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. Now, many of these intellectuals joined the political party. They formed it at the end of 1988. Uh, it consolidated its position in 1989, the Alliance of Free Democrats. They were prominent in the elections of 1990, the first free elections. They were well represented in the new parliament. The distinguished sociologist, Ivan Seleni, who had been living in exile for quite a long time by 1990, he was astonished by what was going on in Budapest, in his native city. The cream of the oppositional intelligentsia was suddenly winning elections, well represented in parliament. Uh, Seleni wrote quite uh, wittily, I think, about the benches of the Hungarian parliament uh, looking like an academy of the social sciences, because almost every politician in the Free Democrats had a PhD at least. Now, why is this interesting or relevant for us tonight? Let me go to the small town about 120, 130 kilometers away from Budapest, where I've been doing field work recently. The Free Democrats won the election of 1990 in this small town. They provided the first democratically elected mayor and he was re-elected four years later in 1994, but only after dissociating himself from that party of the former intellectual dissidents. Those liberals had lost all credibility within just a few years, above all in the eyes of small town businessmen who complained why nobody in the capital city was doing anything for them. The city, small town experienced a lot of deindustrialization, very high unemployment, and nobody in the big city really seemed to care. It was as if they had been abandoned by the elites. There was no politician who came to campaign for the Free Democrats in this small town, ever. Now, it's a very different situation in this part of Hungary today. All the villages, all the small towns are controlled by Viktor Orban's party because they are not making the same mistake in organizing democratic politics that the liberals made. Viktor Orban has visited this town himself on a number of occasions. He is not an aloof academic who stays in the big city. He insinuates himself as a man of the people. That's the key to his populism. Now, this brings me to the first of my questions. Uh, if we are talking about the retreat of liberal democracy, that's Gabo's title, should we not attach some of the responsibility for this retreat to the liberal politicians of that era. Are they not the first cohort of political rogues, to take up the terminology of Gabor himself? Is it surprising that this elite party collapsed altogether by the time Viktor Orban came back to power in 2010? I am suggesting here that uh, we shouldn't just tell a story about post-socialist Eastern Europe, Hungary and Poland, that similar developments are taking place with the rise of populism pretty much everywhere in Europe and certainly in Britain. I've not actually lived in my native country for many years now, but I have the impression that Jeremy Corbyn's campaign had a London version of that Academy of Social Sciences helping to draw up the Labour Manifesto in 2019, but it didn't work in places like the deindustrialized town that I come from in South Wales. There is a lot of cynicism towards those intellectuals. The social science expertise in the labor supporting think tanks in the big city, it doesn't help in situations like the one that Gabo has analyzed in Hungary. So this is my first question. It's about the responsibility of liberal intellectuals and whether, whether these intellectuals can play a public role at all in modern democracies, or would they be better advised to just keep quiet? And one second question in the few minutes that I've got left, or perhaps a third if, if I'm very quick. Second question concerning the nature of industrialization in a 
backward area, the agrarian periphery of Europe, where I did my field work just east of the Danube, it certainly meets the criteria. No industry at all before the socialist period. The socialists invest quite carefully to bring industry from the big city to the small town. They start a new industrial estate. A new small proletariat emerges in this town. Housing estates are built, jobs are created. The town is modernized. It loses its agrarian character. All of this happens quite quickly in the 1950s, 60s and 70s. The trend has already changed by the 1980s. I was interested to find recently that the proportion of the population employed in industry fell quite dramatically in the 1980s. In other words, in the last decade of socialism, this cannot simply be attributed to the impact of market capitalism after 1990. So my question to Gabor is what does he think about the nature of that, if you like, market socialism? I know not everybody's comfortable with that label, but what the Hungarians were trying to do, in particular, after the reforms in 1968, in the last decades of socialism, to merge elements of the market with socialism in the sense that the means of production remained in collective hands. Was this unviable economically, as well as being incompatible with democratic politics? I would be very interested in your views on that. And in 30 seconds now, and then I really should stop, I would just like to quibble about your use of the term authoritarian. It's there in the title of your book, and I can well understand why, why liberal intellectuals would see the present regime in Budapest as authoritarian. I see it as authoritarian in so many ways, but from the grassroots where I do field work, even the scheme of workfare, which for many intellectual commentators exemplifies the repressive nature of populism in contemporary Eastern Europe, but local attitudes to workfare turn out to be surprisingly sympathetic. In other words, they strike a chord that is much older than socialism in Hungarian society. People, including oppressed minorities such as the Roma, welcome the opportunity to earn wages, even if it's less than the official minimum wage, because that is better than surviving on handouts from the state. As anthropologists know very well from a famous essay by Marcel Mauss, handouts are somehow insulting. They wound the recipient. And even the Roma in this small town where I'm working at the moment are quite pleased to be forced to get out of bed in the morning and do public works and earn wages compared to receiving state handouts, which was their fate for the 20 years in which the socialists and the liberals were sharing power in Hungary. So I'll stop there and recommend everybody to go out and buy Gabor's book because it's the most important political economy analysis of what's going on in that part of the world that I have ever read. Thank you. That's great, Chris. Thank you very much. It's really helpful. Uh, our next commentator is uh, Dr. Cheryl Stoshein. Uh, she, Cheryl is a reader in politics in the Department of Political Science at University College London and was an ISRF mid-career fellow in 2017-18, working on a project on ethnic enclaves in four Eastern European states. At UCL, she has directed the master's program on democracy and comparative politics since 2005, which gives a sense, I think, of her, the general ambit of her interests. She took her bachelor's degree from Amherst College in Massachusetts and her PhD from Columbia University in New York. Her research focuses particularly on the effects of race, ethnicity, and religious difference in democratic and democratizing states. Much of this research draws on in-depth experience in Eastern Europe, some of which appeared in her edited collection, Governance in Ethnically Mixed Cities, which came out in 2007, and also in her award-winning book, Ethnic Struggle, Coexistence, and Democratization, in Eastern Europe, which appeared with Cambridge in 2011. Um, I'm really quite pleased that we had a copy that I could read here in the office. Um, this work features particularly interesting and immersive chapters on incidents that occurred in Hungary's borderlands with Slovakia, Romania, and the Ukraine, from which Cheryl inducts larger patterns. Her research is particularly focused on how contention helped forge common rules and institutions 
during the democratic transition in these mixed states where minority Hungarians and ethnic majorities disagree on language policy, local government, public administration structure, and public symbols. Her work, in short, is quite complementary to Gabor's, and it's a real pleasure and an honor to have you with us, Michelle. Thank you. Um, I really was so honored to read this book, and I felt like I was going back through my life um, because I started going to Hungary in 1990, and the book really starts from that point. In essence, this book is a critique of what we've sort of thought of as the transition paradigm. And I think it, it applies well beyond Hungary. It really helps us to understand what's going on in a lot of places. And um, I saw Sean Hanley made a comment in the Q&A. In essence, there are several of us who work on Eastern Europe, who are including Sean Hanley, who are thinking about how what's going on in Eastern Europe is instrumental in understanding what's happening in Western Europe and in the United States, for example. So that's the point I'm starting from. And I have three things I want to talk about. The first is this idea of generalizability or the kind of macro causes going on. The second is about what I sort of called micro causes or agency. And this will relate to how the working classes have envisioned their situation. And the third is about doing research. So um, I'm not going to dwell that much on the causal argument that Gabor outlined so well, but I want to just highlight along the way a tip of the iceberg note on some of the ways in which the argument differs from the transition paradigm and why the transition paradigm has broken down in essence there. So the first part of the argument is that the early stage of transition, the government made an alliance with transnational capital. Now, this alliance is simply assumed in the kind of Washington consensus or the approach taken during the 1990s. We didn't think about it in sociological terms, and nor did we think about the kind of revolving doors whereby people would cycle in and out of transnational companies and then into the Hungarian government. All of this is a really important part of the story. Also, a decrease in taxation to be competitive. So he calls this the competition state. This was the idea that you simply have to starve your populations of taxes in order to attract foreign domestic, uh, sorry, for FDI, foreign direct investment, I think it was called at the time. And this of course led to kind of social disintegration as you're removing state supports. Um, and Gabor makes this very interesting comment that I didn't realize, but I could see it. Um, as it came through, that the government was actually overzealous, that transnational corporations would have accepted less of this kind of zealotry on the part of the government, but instead the government really, there were other things going on. So for example, technocrats that might want to get jobs by proving how great they are at pushing this neoliberal line. So that's a really interesting kind of sociological subtext going on throughout the discussion. This breakdown of the social contract that was perceived by the masses or citizens led to resentment, as now seems obvious. But at the time, we really did forget about those working classes in a way that's kind of shocking to me now as we look back at, it, at the situation, just as we've forgotten them in Western Europe and um, the United States as well. Now, a key part of this argument is that not all capitalists are the same. So transnational capitalists were not like domestic capitalists. They're working in different sectors. And in the end, in the light of this kind of social breakdown, the state, and I'm kind of editorializing here, but the, the government needed support and they could get support from domestic capitalists. They needed that revenue as well. They needed to work together. And so an alliance was formed between domestic capital and the government at that point. And this is where nationalism comes in in a way I haven't thought of before or seen before, even though I work on nationalism. And I've underlined this notion here, that I, a word I don't see in the book called mercantilism, the idea that we need to protect our own economically and work with our own economically. And that very much comes through. And I'd be, it's one of my questions whether mercantilism is a word that we can use to describe this kind of idea. But this pro-Hungarian industry stance linked up with a kind of nationalism. And this is where we got what Gabor calls the accumulative state. And in this situation, 
the unskilled labor that was needed by the domestic capitalists, um, we reached a situation where in spite of the fact that the government seemed to be wooing them with nationalism and telling them, we'll, we'll get to this in the next section, that we're storing the social contract sort of through nationalism. In essence, labor is being repressed by quite repressive labor laws. Um, there's a really interesting, important discussion on that. So there are political strategies used so that domestic capitalists can kind of sit on top of labor and get what they need out of extract um, what they need out of them in essence. So there's this phrase that I really love on page 333. This, um, it's, it's illiberalism as a new authoritarian form of neoliberalism. I think that explains very well what's going on in Hungary. So the end of this first section, I have a few questions. Can this happen anywhere? Could we work this up into a real generalizable statement on what happens when you're trying unsuccessfully to navigate all of these different problems when you're integrating into the global economy? Um, another question, why not accommodate labor instead? Is it because the state had run out of money? So instead they get repressed. Um, one example that didn't appear in the book was Pinochet's Chile. And I was wondering if that might also tell us something about the generalizability of the model. Um, I wrote in throughout the book in the margins, Brexit, 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 because I think this example of what's gone on in the UK, which honestly, even though I live in London, makes no sense to me most of the time, um, except there are moments where the mention, for example, of public procurement as being a place where domestic capitalists can really make money in alliance with the government, that looks all like the COVID-19 crisis in Britain. So um, and right now there's a big corruption scandal going on with the UK government. So um, one of the last things I'll say, actually I'll say it now, is I would love to see a project on the UK using these same ideas to think about what happened with Brexit. Why did the left abandon labor? Now, I think that Chris Hahn got at this a little bit as well, this, this notion that the left wasn't behaving as we would expect. Instead, they were very, very pro everything the liberal part paradigm that they were imposing on labor. And I'm wondering if left and right no longer really matter. Okay, I'm gonna go, these next two sections will be much shorter um, because they're a little bit less complex. So getting to agency, this is a really interesting and important story about the working class that had been abandoned. And then thinking about how they can be incorporated into control structures. So if you think of, um, Fidesz as building a kind of control pyramid, which Babur calls a corporate state party. I think that's a really good um, idea, a way to think about how it reaches down and everyone is kind of brought into the control structure, even with these workfare programs. And it changes the way we think about how a state works that's supposed to be democracy. So with these alliances, um, Gabor talks about how Barrington Moore had said, well, no bourgeoisie, no democracy, which I teach my students. But the sharing model is the bourgeoisie must see that the democracy is in their interests. And if it isn't, they might align with the state to repress democracy. It all depends on what their goals might be. Um, now, getting to the working classes, there's a very sympathetic story here told about how the working classes were resentful at being forgotten in the 1990s and how that resentment becomes a resource for Orban. We've seen it become a resource, of course, elsewhere, um, which we could talk about in the discussion. And nationalism, and this was my favorite part of the book because I work on nationalism and it's a better understanding of nationalism that I think I've seen anywhere in a long time. Nationalism brings a promise of equality and then it gives people the perception that the social contract is being restored because we're all the same as part of this nation. And what it does, and Gabor outlines this very clearly, it removes the element of class such that there's nothing standing between the individual and the nation. So if I don't want to think of myself as an individual, as in liberalism, I only have the nation to draw on. I don't have an intermediary identity. The problem is, of course, is that financially, the real life situation of people is still declining. So how stable is this situation? 
um, but it provides people a notion of having some control and agency, and it provides them a sense of community through the nation. So a couple of questions that come out of this. Um, the first one, without the immigration crisis in 2015, would this have played out in the same way? And the second question is, are some of these elements applying also to the Hungarians abroad, the Hataron Tuli Madarok, who live in Romania, in Serbia? Are they being brought into that pyramid as well? And then I think I'm really kind of overstepping a bit on time. So I'm going to cut this kind of short, but I want to say three things about doing research. First is, this is a big project. Great. It's interdisciplinary. Economics, politics, sociology is all in, in here. Um, my former supervisor, so the late Charles Tilly, would have loved this project. Um, in order to answer a complex question, what happened here and why? Simple question, very complex to research. You have to study from several angles and look at it over time. The devil's in the details and it's an incremental story. This took a lot of time to write. It took me a lot of time to read this book. I loved every minute of it. I learned a lot. These big projects are rarely supported and I really appreciate that the ISRF supported this. Um, on causal mechanisms, Charles Tilly would have loved this. I just want to give a tip to the iceberg philosophical moment. This is where structure meets agency. So this, we wouldn't have things happen in politics without some agency to make things change. Otherwise, it's just big structures. And Gabor describes this kind of approach as relational. So we have to think about the class alliances and people within the classes do things or the elites make an alliance. There's brokerage. Um, this is a really important way to start to think theoretically about what's going on here, because you can think then about the structural context and agency. Um, finally, and this is one of my favorite things, there's an implicit sociology of knowledge going on, and intellectuals are not absent or innocent in this story. They are the vanguard of neoliberalism in the 1990s. And they want to advance their careers. They want better jobs. They want to get jobs in banks. And they're really pushing neoliberalism. And that's a very active part of this story. And in fact, it gives me a sense of why perhaps when you talk to people who support Orban, this idea of nem liberal, liberal, sorry, I can't speak here anymore, not liberal. And they're explicitly drawing a distinction between liberalism, which immediately makes people think of the 1990s and what's happening now. And that resonates. It resonates very strongly, as you just heard from Chris Hahn. Um, so just a couple methodological questions to be uh, uh, inquisitive, but also just to kind of push a bit on some of the aspects of the book, um, just to end on some detail, because the book is so detailed. There are some countries that are not included in the graphs, which show where Hungary's placement is. And I was really curious about what would happen if we included Serbia or Romania in those graphs, because those also have quite pyramidal control structures where you've got a strong elite at the center, although in Romania, they just keep rotating around. But in Serbia, that's a very stable elite um, in Vujic. Um, also, I'm wondering if there's a way to systematize the study of career trajectories, because at some points it seemed a bit gossipy of sort of this guy did this and then he did this, and it's really important to have those details, but I'm wondering if we could create a theoretical approach that makes that a more systematic thing that we can take and apply in different countries more easily. And finally, please say that you're going to write a project on the UK and Brexit, and with that I am finished. <laughs> Um, I want to second that last part. There's uh, just a, a lot of important questions in both of these comments. Um, it is also getting close to the top of the hour. Gabor, you have the floor. Um, there are things that you may want to address in the two comments as per schedule. There are also um, very important points coming up in the 10 questions that we have on deck here. So I will um, let you decide how you want to proceed if you want to turn it over to the questions or start with commentators. Yeah, um, thank you uh, both Cheryl and, and Chris. Uh, uh, amazing uh, comments and, and, and a great way of uh, summarizing some of my arguments and, and 
uh, good good points to uh, to reflect on also sort of uh, friendly criticism here and there. Um, so uh, I have a few brief uh, uh, answers, and then I also saw really amazing questions in the Q and A box, and I, I hope to to have. Uh, uh, some time to 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 answer those as well. I mean, really amazing questions, both uh, from from Sharon and Chris and and, and there. So I, I I'm, I'm not sure if we'll have time all to to really to to, to get into to the substantive details. So um, uh, let's start with Chris with us first. So uh, I, I fully agree uh, uh, that we need to go back in time more uh, and also explore or the way uh, neoliberalism was rooted in, in, in the uh, socialist times in Hungary. I do this in, in, in one section of the book, so I, I analyze uh, 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 basically the last decades of, of state socialism in the country, showing how a particular way of uh, economic discourse is emerged out of uh, those debates uh, during, uh, uh, during socialist times and how particular technocrats uh, uh, occupied dominant uh, positions uh, or led in the 80s that then led them to occupy also key policymaking positions in the in the 90s, which was crucial. And as Sherry pointed out, a sort of a uh, bit subdued, but there is indeed this sociology of elites and sociology of knowledge uh, dimension to the book. Uh, I, 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 it's, it's, uh, I, I didn't go into the details, but I created this data set about the career trajectories of economists and politicians and I was just amazed by how someone could, could in year one uh, be a PR uh, uh, director for, uh, you know, an Austrian or, or British company in Hungary, and then in year two uh, be a minister or, or secretary of state, you know, and, and you have many cases of this, almost all of them uh, with uh, involving uh, left wing or left liberal politicians. Um, and I have this table, I, I, I give some of the numbers, I even run some, some logistic regressions to, to show that there is really a significant association between economic background and, and political preferences, but I didn't really systematize the, the, the career uh, trajectory angle. But I think what, what is crucial here is that really is the competition going on, uh, not just for foreign capital, but for recognition by foreign capital and, and, and international institutions. And not only states want to have this recognition, but also the actors themselves who make up the states and who make decisions want to have the recognition. And the way to have recognition is to speak the language and the dominant language of the era was the neoliberal language. So this was uh, one of the key factors that, that led to this overzealousness in, 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 many, in many cases, as you very well pointed out. And I show in my book, and there's also great research out there which, which shows how uh, some, for example, during OECD negotiations, how OECD actors uh, wanted to slow down Hungary in terms of capital account opening, but Hungarian policymakers were like, no, 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 we want to go ahead as fast as, as, as we can. So, uh, yeah, just a quick side note on that. Um, the industrialization also started indeed uh, in, the, in the 80s, but it was especially quick uh, at the last years, during the last years, and uh, economic liberalization in Hungary already started during those last years uh, of, 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 uh, of state socialism. So the last socialist government was really like a technocratic uh, government that laid down the foundations of market economy. And that's when really the, the industrialization process started in the country. So between 1988 and 1995, every second person employed in industry lost their job in Hungary. Every second person, that's a 50% industrialization. I haven't seen any other country uh, uh, experiencing such a devastating deindustrialization. I mean, if you follow the debate in the US, amazing studies produced, amazing book pre books produced, but we are talking about a 30 or 40% of deindustrialization over 30 years in the United States. Same in the UK, you know, it, it, around 30, 40% the industrialization over multiple decades. Here you have the same over seven years. So this is really like dropping an atomic bomb on the, uh, on the fabric of, 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 uh, of society. And we don't really understand. And, and, most, uh, and, and basically intellectuals and researchers 
we underappreciated the, the effect the effect uh, that this has had on on on, on social integration. Um, um, I don't think that market socialism was sustainable in, in a way as it was uh, constructed uh, back then, but I certainly see the many benefits that it had on social integration and creating this kind of, uh, so, so to speak, middle class, uh, uh, especially in rural Hungary, creating stability. And I also refer to this in the interviews. And I definitely do believe that uh, uh, under ideal circumstances, uh, uh, the state should have played a much more aggressive role in terms of industrial policy and other kinds of involvement, social policies, but especially industrial policy to trying to uh, keep some of the socialist companies alive that were collab that collapsed in the in the 90s. And we're talking about companies that were extremely successful. I mean, if you uh, there's a, there was a bus company in the U.S. called North American Bus Industries which was a company funded by the ex, the state socialist bus company in Hungary. So state-run socialist company funded one of the most successful bus companies in, in the US that, 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 uh, uh, that could thrive uh, for almost 15 years there. Uh, so this is just one, one anecdotal example, and I can't really go into the details, but uh, I, I do think that uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, Hungary's economic integration led to into the global economy led to these problems was these policy failures. So uh, going from state socialism to the other side of, uh, of uh, accepting neoliberalism without really paying attention to, to the details of industrial policy, trying to preserve existing capacities and, and trying to really preserve uh, uh, social cohesion in a clever way, because there were policies designed to, to mitigate social tensions, such as uh, allowing people to retire early, played an important role. Also in the early 90s, uh, unemployment benefits were, were quite substantive. Uh, but then, for example, the unemployment benefits were phased out. And of course, younger generations who experienced also precarious uh, situations could not <laughs> go on retirement or go on early retirement. That's why very interestingly in Hungary, but also in Poland, you saw a bigger revolt against liberal capitalism and regular, liberal democracy, especially so against the new regimes uh, and an embracement of illiberalism and nationalism among, among younger generations compared to older generations. So that's why these one of these theories that the more time you spend under socialism makes you more authoritarian breaks down in, in, in Hungary and Poland because the older people were more supportive uh, in terms of democracy than, than the younger generations who really embraced Jobbik and, and, and also uh, more illiberal uh, ideologies by the end of the 2000s. Um, Cheryl, I, I fully agree with you about the uh, that it would be amazing to explore uh, uh, the parallels with Brexit, but also with other countries. I briefly refer to uh, Latin American uh, countries, and and I rely on the political economy of democratization and authoritarianism literature, which really is rooted in in the Latin American scholarship. So one of my favorite books is uh, Guillermo O'Donnell's book on uh, bureaucratic authoritarianism, which really inspired my, my approach, but also the early work on dependency, the dependent development, which isn't really structuralist in a sense we, we think of it these days like word system theory. It's really about forging alliances and how alliances break down and how states and local political elites use these alliances to, to facilitate economic development. Um, so there are traces of this in, in, in the book, uh, but certainly something for, for the near future. Uh, and I really hope to, to be able to continue along these lines. At the, uh, the last side, I mentioned this, this notion of the national populist mutation of uh, neoliberalism. And I really think that Hungary is sort of a laboratory for this. And, and you can see this happening in many other countries, like Trump was a great example. Uh, but I also think that Brexit is also a great example of this, where you had, like in the case of Trump, you had certain kind of capitalists being fed up with globalization. But in the, in the UK, you also had certain neoliberals and businesses also fed up with the European Union. You know, it was Margaret Thatcher herself who claimed that we didn't roll back the state to see it reinstalled at the European Union level. Uh, so to facilitate really 
the, the continued uh, neoliberalization of the economy, some neoliberals thought that, well, we need to go back to nationalism and the nation state, and that's why they started to support Brexit. It's looking differently in different countries. It's different in the case of Brexit than in, in the case of Hungary. Very something comparable happening also in India, where you have a uh, national uh, capitalist class embracing deep nationalism under Modi and promoting nationalism to promote domestic production and also to, to reposition India as a, as a new global player. So there you also have a very interesting fusion of nationalism and, and neoliberalism. So what I see is basically uh, the, the previous phase of global cosmopolitan human rights based neoliberalism is, is basically is, 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 is the, that has ended. And now the question is what, what's going to replace it? Uh, and, and one contender is, is, is the national populist mutation of neoliberalism. I don't see Orban as a challenger to neoliberalism, more like as a new hybridization of neoliberalism. And I think the other alternative is, is, is a more uh, progressive, uh, uh, more social democratic approach. And, and the way the Biden administration is responding to the crisis it sh shows that they were understanding that if they go back to the same centrist politics, the same kind of liberalism as before, it will just recreate the social foundations of, of Trumpism in the US. So they need to invest big and, and go beyond uh, the traditional neoliberal uh, uh, discourse and, and, and thinking. Now, it's still an open question whether this, this will stay with us. I'm a bit skeptical whether this will lead to a long lasting in, in institutional change, but certainly it signals that there, there is a kind of understanding that to, to be the national populist version of neoliberalism, you need to, to have a much more progressive social policy and industrial policy agenda. Very briefly about migration. As you mentioned, it, it hit Hungary in 2015 uh, and it played a role in the 2018 elections. But Viktor Orban already won two elections with two such majority, one in 2010 and, and the second in 2014 without the migration crisis. So certainly it helped him uh, to retain power in 18, but before that, it, it doesn't really explain anything. It certainly was not a, a major political issue in the country. And empirical research shows using the European Social Survey, using the World Value Survey, uh, uh, the Pew research has also showed that uh, the support for liberal values in Hungary uh, until the end of the 2000s was basically on par with other countries also in, in many ways in Western Europe, but certainly higher than in other countries in Eastern Europe that, that did not experience such a massive backsliding. Um, but then Orban used the opportunity to, to, to stoke up fears and of course campaign against uh, migration. So now the country co looks completely different. And this leads me to, 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 to one of the points that was raised by Chris, but also uh, in a Q&A box as well, about how Orban maintains power in the face of these polarizing economic regimes. And, and, and I certainly do think that it's not only about you know, repression and authoritarianism in the, in the institutional sense. So you don't see the military or the police in Hungary, you know, there's no, there's no military coup. Democratic backsliding in Hungary is much more subtle these days. And indeed, Fidesz is uh, embedded deeply uh, uh, sociologically in many ways, much more so than definitely than the left uh, in, in Hungary. Uh, the only contender in terms of social embeddedness is the radical right, which is trying now to moderate itself. Um, so I, in the book, I, I describe two strategies. One is the, is the institutional authoritarian fixes, and you can imagine what these are, uh, uh, rewriting the electoral law, uh, hi hijacking media, et cetera, et cetera. But the other is all these, uh, what I call uh, authoritarian populism. And, and the work fair is really a great example because it's, it's in part a discourse, it's in part a policy that, that addresses a real and existing problem, namely unemployment in rural Hungary. It portrays the state as a caring state as opposed to the, the market will solve everything kind of liberal state. Uh, 
It also solves the discipline workers who, who receive the public work scheme. And it's also popular among those people who don't receive the public works because they think, well, we are better. We don't have to do this kind of shitty public works program. So it's a very clever way of playing into this neo-nationalist sentiment, neo-nationalist culture. And neo-nationalism is really about uh, mainstreaming the, the lower middle class or working class sensibilities towards work, which is pitted against cultural, ethnic, uh, various kinds of minorities, uh, the precariat on the one hand, so in this sense, working class is in the middle. And of course, the elites on the other hand, nasty international bankers, personified by George Soros, who is also a great target because he's also supporting migration. So it's just a beautiful figure to, to, to attack and, and represent this, this disenfranchised uh, uh, neo-nationalist uh, um, uh, middle in, in, in between. Uh, and of course, uh, to, to add to this, I'm, I'm rushing, sorry, uh, uh, today's discursive and policy populist policy practices, Viktor Orban was lucky in a sense of governing um, mm. in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a time when uh, the economy was booming, largely thanks to, to, the, uh, to, to an upward global economic cycle and the investments of uh, transnational corporations uh, who, who, who moved new production to, to existing, mostly to existing plants in, in, in Hungary to, to increase their competitiveness in, in Western Europe. Uh, so this created new jobs and this led to a, a, an increase also in wages. Although the increase in real, real wages, I show this in the book, I cannot be, go into the details, is much lower than, for example, Viktor Orban uh, portrays and, 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 the, and the news uh, really is over-exaggerating uh, the real income increase. And also then we have to factor in uh, the increase in, 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 in income inequality. So these are the factors that explain Victor Obama's political success. So institutional authoritarianism, all these authoritarian populist fixes and the kind of the economic success. And there also, it's also important to see that Urbanomics was not a failure. Like many liberal critiques thought, well, this is nonsense. This will collapse, but uh, it's, it's, it's a poisonous mixture, it's a, it's, it's a poisonous cocktail in many ways, dividing society, but also works in, in, in various other ways. What I would like to do is I'd like to read these to you to get them into the record. Yeah. Uh, invite everyone to stay over time so we, we can run at least till 30 after the hour and give you a chance to address some of these in the extra time, in overtime, as it were. Okay. So um, I'm just going to read these through to you um, from Sean Hanley. How new is this perspective in the region? I recall reading perspectives in the early 1990s, stressing class, capital, and dependency, and predicting authoritarian outcomes in Central Europe, usually comparing to Latin America. In other words, how does it link to earlier work, what you're saying? Um, next question from Liz Fraser. Can you say a bit more about the mechanisms for the political containment of economic losers? Quoting you, how exactly is that achieved? Uh, third question from Juraj Pala, to what degree is this evolution in Hungary reproducing the theory of Karl Polanyi on the rise of authoritarianism as a reaction to free market ideology before World War II in Europe and more generally Polanyi's historical institutionalist account? Next three, this is a question four from Aris Tantitis. Apologies for butchering everyone's name. I am wondering if based on your analysis of the Hungarian case, we can anticipate similar developments towards authoritarianism from a left-wing distributional political economy, i.e. a Biden style developmental mutation of neoliberalism. <laughs> this is scary, but um, actually important question. We have similar trends in terms of social discontent and domestic power coalitions with the bourgeoisie in other countries too, too including the US. Uh, fifth from Kata Morazbek. Um, arguably, Orban does not only invite domestic economic elites to the table, but actually creates them. This group of domestic businessmen are not necessarily sustainable without without the current regime. 
On the other hand, traditional domestic capital owners actually lose out significantly to Fidesz elites. How does this relate to your theory? <laughs> it's really complicated and interesting. Uh, next, Nigel Swain. Do you agree that you use an old fashioned class analysis, not one of abstractions, but of concrete individuals in economics and politics? I think this addresses some of Chris Hahn's comments. Got that? Okay, and then we have four more. Um, from Kyle uh, Shonko, you're taking notes. Are, are, <laughs> um, I'm just gonna, I want everybody to get on the record and then we can go back. In the okay. I, I read uh, most of these, but it's very good that you are repeating them. Uh, and then some of those I already try to answer, but I will definitely go back. So just go ahead and then let's see how I can yeah, the, answer some of these at least. not what the audience sees. So these are redactions from Lars. Um, Kyle Shabunko, following on Professor Hahn's comment, could Gabor say something about there being a simultaneous deindustrialization and reindustrialization in Hungary as the 1980s passed into the 1990s? It seems to me that this makes Hungary's situation unique, certainly when people are tempted to compare the consequences of deindustrialization in Hungary to deindustrialization in the rust belts of France, the UK, et cetera. And for Juraj Pala, a second question. A question to Gabor, do you think that your short career in politics had overall positive or negative effects on your academic career and your present research? Did it make you wiser about the political reality or did it, did it make it difficult to be perceived as an objective researcher in the field? <laughs> it's also really interesting. These are great questions. Um, Alberto Cotica, uh, what, why do you think industrialization is not working? The automotive industry looks exactly like the kind of industry that would over time generate beneficial effects, whether by Hirsch money and linkages or by increasing economic complexity a la Hausmann Hidalgo. Why not in Hungary? And Tom Linus, I believe this is the last question. What international influences were there in these developments? One that occurs to me arises from Professor Hahn's comments. In 1989, the first countries in which the previous order collapsed were those which had taken on the greatest foreign debts in the era of detente, namely Poland, Hungary, and Yugoslavia. That amounted to an instrument to detach them from the Comcom bloc. How much was deindustrialization in the 1980s a consequence of that decade's debt crisis as it was on on other continents such as Latin America and Africa. Okay, so you have to write a second book that addresses <laughs> 10, but you get a start right now if you still have the energy to do it. <laughs> okay, um, so um, let, let me try to answer briefly. I, I, there were a couple of questions related to uh, um, I, I copied these in, in, in a separate word for me and yeah, if I am not able to answer now, I'm really happy to, to, to continue via email. You can reach me in, in many various uh, ways. So I'm, I'm, if I can't answer you now, I'm re really happy to, to follow up later on. So there were a couple of questions about um, uh, the domestic, uh, domestic capitalist class. I think three people uh, uh, raised this issue, whether it's only uh, uh, a, a narrow elite or, or do I see it as a broader one? And I think that there is a, um, uh, there is a, a, a focus uh, uh, in, in the media on, on Victor Orban's friends and, and relatives. And they are certainly the most important winners. Um, and there's a lot of corruption involved. And certainly these guys are, completely unable or would be completely unable uh, to, to survive under normal uh, market circumstances. But what I show in the book is that there is a much larger segment of the domestic elite, e capitalist elite, economic elite that supports Viktor Orban. And I show this empirically, clearly by, by analyzing the uh, press material of, of various domestic lobby groups and, and a, a large number of uh, businessmen in, in, in Hungary. And uh, there are who support Orban for uh, ideological reasons, 
Uh, but one of the largest groups is what I call the, the rising capitalists uh, or the emerging uh, businesses. And these are people who are not corrupt. Uh, these, these are people who, mostly these are people who didn't take part at all in the privatization. And they were lobbying heavily already the previous governments to, to stop only supporting uh, transnational corporations uh, in terms of uh, tax incentives that they, they cannot uh, take this, cannot uh, cope with this free competition and they need more support from the state. And it was Orban who first understood this and responded to their claims. And in response, uh, these elite groups uh, started to support Orban as well. In fact, there was a survey done uh, in Hungary, uh, uh, repeat uh, first in 2015 and repeated, I think, in 18 or 19, which has showed that the biggest increase uh, for the support is the support of authoritarianism, authoritarian solutions, took place at the very top of society. So although it's true that Orbán's friends and family are the most important winners, it's, it's not true that everyone else is losing out. And my claim is that otherwise the regime would have already collapsed. Uh, there is a very, very large group of businesses that wins. And I, I show this in the book in various ways, all the, the, the economic policy instruments that go beyond public procurement. If you analyze only public procurement, you will see corruption. But there are 10 other different economic uh, policy strategies that support uh, businesses in more general, including transnational corporations who also, especially in the export, industrial export sector, also support uh, Victor Orban. So I don't have the time to get more into the details. I, I love this topic. Uh, I, I also wrote a short article about this, why businesses support populists. It's at the available at the conversation. So there are some more arguments about this. Um, Indeed, uh, the, the first question, uh, how is this, uh, to what extent is this a new perspective? Uh, and Cheryl already highlighted uh, some of the ways in which it is not new and, uh, and some of the ways it is new. So it's not new in a sense that uh, it, it builds heavily on existing research uh, that was out there already using a class analytical framework or dependency theory. Um, but if one looks at the literature on, on the collapse of democracy, uh, then uh, the application of, of uh, especially the, the, the theory of dependent development. Um, so I'm not using world system theory, I'm making this fine green uh, distinction between the two. Um, although I'm also sympathetic towards world system theory if, if done with a sensitivity towards agency, but in, in some cases it's, 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 I think, too structuralist. And that's why I'm using dependency theory or the theory of dependent development. And I combine it with what, what Sheryl has highlighted, a relational approach to class, which is very much influenced, by the way, by anthropology. So I bring in this, this anthropological theory of class, very much dynamical, focusing on actors on the ground, in this case, elite actors, but also workers, and how they create alliances and how old alliances are breaking down and how all new alliances are, are emerging. So combining this relational approach to class with dependency theory and then using this to explain authoritarianization, I think this is what, what is, uh, what is uh, new uh, with, relation, uh, with regard to, to other explanations, also some of the political economic uh, explanations. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, existing accounts uh, are, are, are not valid, but what I'm saying is, is that, that this is a neglected aspect, a neglected dimension in most cases that needs to be considered and taken more, more seriously. Um, I, I think I already uh, answered a question about the mechanisms for the political containment of economic losers previously about in institutional authoritarianism and authoritarian populism and Orban's luck with, the, uh, with, with growth. Um, and I certainly do believe uh, that Hungary's case is sort of Polanyan. And with Chris, we are editing a special issue of Europasia Studies, if I may plug in some marketing here, uh, which has the title Polanyan Counter Movements or Illiberal Counter Movements in, in Eastern Europe. And, and, and I also have an article there uh, forthcoming. And, and it's an attempt to, to look at the rise of illiberalism from this, this Polanyan 
Polanyan uh, uh, counter movement. Uh, and I, there's a, another question about similar developments in other cases like, like the US. Yes, and uh, again, I can't really go more into the details here. I previously briefly referred to high CDs as, as uh, in, in many ways similar. Of course, there are huge differences. Uh, and uh, I also have a separate article on how Hungary offers insights uh, for, for populism in, 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 in Hungary. Also one in, in a, the International Sociological Association's magazine called the Global Dialogue. I also go into the details how the collapse of democracy Deaths of despair and the industrialization are related to each other, both big topics in the US and I also think in, 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 in Eastern Europe. Um, uh, yes, I agree with Nigel Swain that it's, uh, it's an old fashioned class analysis in a sense that it's, it's, it's not about abstractions and it's not moving only at the macro level, but it zooms in onto individuals also and, and their alliances. And, and this is definitely not new. So when contemporary economic anthropology uh, invented the relational class analysis. It was very much influenced by these very early uh, Marxian uh, class analysis as well, like especially uh, 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 the more politically more sensitive uh, Marxian texts uh, 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 were, were definitely uh, instru instrumental in the development of this uh, relational class analysis. And about, I also want to add that I not only think that agency is crucial to explain these new class alliances, but also uh, I, I think that, so neo-nationalism is in a way a culture, a culture that, that brings in a kind of national solid community of solidarity. So I don't think culture is not important. And of course, political culture is also important because politicians always use existing and available narratives to build these alliances, to change alliances and fuel, build on popular neo-nationalist sentiments as well. But what I do is relate this to, to class dislocations and the lived experience of class. I have this theory chapter, may, it, it, it's, maybe it's not clear now the way I describe it, but I, I'm trying to bring, bring these together, this, this sensitivity to, to, to politics and agency, culture, and also geographical inequalities have to be taken into, into account. But let's not get into the details. Gabor, yeah, this, we have yes. to, we are yeah, we're up against um, 6.30 here. Okay. Do you want to say one, uh, you have one final thought to leave us with? Well, the last part, question I, I, I was trying to answer, and there are a few others that I, I will not be able to answer. We're going about. to um, forward you the additional questions. And so okay. can be in touch after the Okay. So about politics. And um, it's a very, very tricky situation. And it's it's not me who is going to judge this. So it's it's the readers and, and, and fellow experts who, who will be able to judge this. But um, the preface of my book is is really a, a, a bow to to Fernando Cardoso uh, and 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 his work uh, on on dependency and and he himself was was part of social scientists and, and of course a, a politician and uh, later much more liberal than in his uh, early uh, structuralist Marxian analysis certainly and and I also gave a, a a short quote from from their book from Fernando Cardoso uh, for, from the book on on dependency. Uh, uh, theory, dependent development, about uh, how change in history is, is basically possible because of the daring of people who are willing to act in terms of historically viable goals. And to what this means to me is, is that there is agency, so change in history depends on this agency, but, and for that you need a kind of, you know, uh, 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 sensitivity to politics, at least. Um, but then what historically viable goals mean is that, you know, you really have to understand the deep structural opportunities and limitations on agency as well. And that's why I like uh, this, 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 this book uh, 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 so much on, on, on dependent development, because it has this fascinating uh, uh, 
theoretical framework that I think is a brilliant combination of, of structural and, 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 and structure and agency and the sensitivity to both. And the, I, I can only hope that in, you know readers and, and fellow scholars and academics will think that I was not too much carried over by my wish to re-democratize Hungary uh, and and I, I I was able to to present some convincing arguments about the underlying structure dynamics and and the way uh, illiberal agency uh, was involved in, in stabilizing authoritarian capitalism in Hungary. And thank you again for the for the opportunity and the great comments and questions. Thank you, Gabor. I mean, I think one of the key phrases of what you just said is the the possibilities of the deep structures that you're complex analysis does quite a good job of bringing to the surface and, and making visible. And it certainly um, helped me feel like we could start to see over the horizon of what you're calling cosmopolitan neoliberalism into other ways of organizing both uh, economics and, and democratic societies. So I wanna thank you for this work and it's really invaluable. And also Chris and Cheryl for making these um, quite valuable comments to all of us. Uh, and to the audience for hanging in there. Your questions will be addressed by Gabor offline. <laughs> of that, we can, <laughs> we can rest assured. Thanks everyone for coming and we will see you next time. Thank you for joining us. For ISRF updates and information about future events, please sign up to our mailing list at www.isrf.org forward slash mailing list. See you again soon. Goodbye.